Welcome, everyone, to episode number five of the Getting to Know You podcast. I'm joined today by a gentleman I met in a different life some years ago who is now running NewOrleansMusicians.com. Mr. David Trahan, thank you for joining me. What's up, man? How you doing? Doing just fine, man. Let's get this going. Tell me, uh, where, were, where were you born? I was born in River Ridge. Okay, so right outside New Orleans? Mm-hmm. How was growing up down there? And when, when were you born? Uh, 1976, man. It was uh, it was quiet. Um, it's it's kind of a, a place unto itself. River Ridge and Harahan neighbor each other. Uh, Harahan is its own municipality. So um, and it's not on the way to anything. It's right up against the river uh, near the Huey P. Long Bridge on the east bank. And um, so it's kind of an out of the way place. You get that feeling, you know. When you're around there, there's, uh, you know, neighborhood ball fields and, and uh, not a whole lot of traffic or commerce, you know. Yeah, I lived in River Ridge, uh, first drive out of college. I moved back down there. Um, it was a rental property, though. I mean, we traveled to Winn-Dixie and back. But uh, the traffic on Jefferson did get pretty bad, <laughs> you know, in the evenings. But that was in 2008. <clears throat> uh, when did you leave River Ridge? Um, well, so my parents got divorced when I was about nine. And, um, so where does that put us? Uh, 85 or excuse me. Yeah. 85. Yeah. About 85. So, um, so when my parents got divorced, uh, I stayed in the same house for a little while. And then, um, my mom eventually met somebody remarried and we moved and we moved to, uh, Kenner for a little while, uh, stayed there for a little while. They ended up selling that house, moved to Metairie. And, um, that was, uh, near where Al Copeland lived, um, uh, up against the, 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 the lake as opposed to the river now. And, um, that's where I spent, uh, my preteen into teenage years. Okay. Where's, uh, were you drawn to anything in school growing up? Uh, good question. I mean, at that point in my life, um, I excelled scholastically and, um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that I was drawn to anything in school in particular, but, uh, I, f I found it easy to get through, easy to come by. I was in gifted and talented classes and, um, you know, um, I, I can't really say at that point in my life, I had a goal or anything, you know what I'm saying? I, I was kind of young, but, um, yeah, that was it. I mean, I, I guess average kid, above average student, but just, you know, average kid playing in the in the streets until the lights came on like we all did. You know? What about music? Where did your passion for that begin? My mother played piano um, all my life. And I began, I think I took like a summer or two piano lessons. And I really liked it. Um, I didn't keep going to uh, music theory classes, but uh, it kind of stuck with me. And there was a piano in the house, so I always played that. Um, my grandmother had a piano in her house, so when I was over there, I would play there too. And um, it was just uh, something that I always did for no reason at all. And it was it was the kind of thing that uh, I felt different after I sat down and played for a while, you know, like super calm, real peaceful, you know. Yeah, I do. I've got a piano in the other room, as a matter of fact. Awesome. Um, all right. So getting through high school, did you did you attend college? Were you scholastically driven uh, to that point? Uh, I'd say high school, I started screwing off a bunch. Um, caught a big attitude, like, I guess around puberty, <laughs> you know, and um, then uh, on to high school. Uh, my, my mother didn't want me to attend. Uh, public school, um, which at that time would have been Bonneville, because at that time we were living in Kenner. And um, she was not at all happy with Bonneville, so she decided that she wanted to put me in private school. And uh, private schools are like a, it's like a microcosm of reality, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tiny little patch. Which one did you attend, if I may? Yeah, uh, I went to Ridgewood. Okay. Ridgewood Preparatory School. Okay. And um, 
so you know you 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 have to be accepted you go for an interview and you know oh, what books have you read recently and all of this other stuff you know so um and and by that time like i i'd already had my brushes with not the law quite yet but i was on my path you know and um <clears throat> uh still found it fairly easy to you know not pay that much attention in class but get by you know and make decent grades you know if not above average so uh, that's what i continue to do but uh like i said with with private schools it's 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 not it's not reality like when you step out your door it's uh unto itself and um there's still like you know little clicks in private schools just like in high schools public high schools and, and things of that nature it's just on a smaller scale so it, it, the lines are more i guess defined and uh you're either in or you're out you know and um i just found it more accepting and easier to get along with people that were uh you know into doing bad shit, i guess or using drugs and things like that so i just kind of hung out with those guys because you know it, it didn't matter you weren't on a football team and it didn't matter that uh you threw the greatest part is you could just you know i guess uh how would you put it they were less judgmental than most i guess yeah and just hanging out myself, you know? yeah yeah so I, I guess that's all I could say about uh, the whole private school thing. Um, that's just happened. I just happened to find myself within that group of people, and um, I didn't. I didn't really spend a lot of time with many of the people that I went to school with outside of school, if that makes any sense. Maybe two or three. The rest of my friends were either from the neighborhood or uh you know from other schools with like minds things like that you know? did that lead you to college um yeah believe it or not I, I did go to college um and i was in there for just under two years and i had to work at the same time keep a job and um i don't know man it it, it started to piss me off honestly I, uh, I was interested in biological sciences and um, didn't really care much for mathematics or anything in that field. Um, and I had an A in math and a D in biology. <laughs> and it was, I had determined that it was because you basically were tasked with just memorizing as much information as quickly as you could possibly memorize it and then regurgitating it for a test, whether or not it resonated with you didn't matter, whether or not uh, you understood it didn't matter. And um, it was sink or swim, you know, and it, it started to be kind of disheartening and I got distracted. You know? So did you end up dropping out and going straight to work? Yeah, I did. And I was working the whole time I was going there and, um, it was a frantic pace. Uh, sometimes I would I would drive out to UNO and uh, catch a class, um, leaving work early, and then going back to work afterwards for a few hours, and then leaving again and going back for an evening class. Um, it was it was really hectic. Yeah. But uh, after I decided to drop out, um, I, I guess I realized that I better I better work hard full time and it's something better making more money than these little part time things that I could scrape together in between classes you know, because it wasn't going to pay any bills. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to stick around um, my parents house, my dad at the time, I wasn't gonna be able to stick around there or expect to stick around there. Because it was kind of like the unspoken rule, you know, you're you're here because you're going to school and I'm trying to help you do that, you know. And then where did you end up going to work? Uh, or how did you end up I think you said you uh, worked offshore for a little while. Yeah, I did. Um, so by the time I was 18, um, I was living on my own. And um, right before offshore, leading up to offshore, I was working at a loading dock uh, in the Clearview, uh, Elmwood area. Um, and making decent money. Um, I, I guess, you know, whatever I, I could do at the time. And it was, it was better than construction because leading up to that, 
I had, uh, what did I do? I was working in uh, industrial construction. I would get in turnarounds at plants, refining plants and, and, um, you know, it's bust ass work and a whole lot of it. And then all of a sudden there's nothing. So, um, when that happened one too many times, I started working at warehouses nearby and that's what I was doing right before I got the offshore job. I had, I'd been applying for the offshore job and calling those people for the better part of a year because I didn't have any experience. So they didn't really, you know, they weren't chomping at the bit to get with me, but, um, I would keep in touch with them and call them damn near every week <laughs> for the better part of a year. And finally they gave me a job, you know, but I, I think I was working at a print place, uh, printing labels. It was a warehouse, another warehouse in the Elmwood area, you know. How did you hear about the offshore job? Because I grew up in the in the same area, but it was never <clears throat> never even a thought for me. I uh, okay, so I got laid off from the loading dock and um, filed for unemployment, and you had to go through their office to uh, file and. Uh, you'd check in with them and they would they would uh, let you use the, their computer, which had uh, directories of uh, nearby places uh, looking for employees. And they also kept track of your progress that way, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the jobs that was listed in their database was for uh, it, it was it was a, a listing for a hiring fair for uh, Tidewater Marine. And so um, I believe that was in Homa. I want to say it was at home. They held it at a hotel in a conference room. And um, that's how I found about it, found out about it and uh, went there and jumped through all the hoops and all of that good stuff. Uh, but still had to keep calling them constantly because, like I said, I, I had zero experience. So I was probably bottom of the totem pole at that point, you know. So tell me about working offshore. It was exciting for me. Um, at that point in my life, um, I mean, obviously, it was a huge bump up in pay. Um, there was just a complete change of atmosphere. Um, aside from the obvious, you know, being on the water and such, uh, this is a place that you go to and, and stay there for a month. There's no more traffic going to work, traffic getting home from work, car trouble, uh, this bill, that bill. Um, you set them up and knock them down as far as bills go. And then, you leave and you're out there for a month and it looking back it was kind of a turning point for me because at that time it wasn't like i was out robbing houses at night but i mean i was just up to no good like i you know my spare time was spent uh, at that time in my life um you know getting high or drunk or just hanging with other people that had zero goals and maybe less than me or less going for them than me, you know? I, I was brought up around people that had strong work ethic and um, I, I didn't disagree with that or, or try to live my life any other way. So I always held a job and it was usually in, in uh, construction or um, working on vehicles or whatever I could do, you know, to make some money. So I wasn't scared of the hard work, but um, it, took away from me all of the negative elements that I allowed myself to be around constantly, which was staying up and out late all night, you know, especially, you know, on the weekends, if you didn't have work, you'd stay out until daylight downtown and all over the city and just doing shit that you shouldn't have been doing, you know? So it gave me a chance to not only dry out as far as, uh, not drinking every other day or every day, but, uh, and you had to stay drug free to keep that job. So those were two things that I had to change in my life, which for a lot of people, maybe that's not a big deal, but for some people, if the other way is a way of life, then you look at that, like, ah, uh, maybe not, you know, some people shy away from that sort of thing, but I went with it. And it also showed me that a month later, when I got back, I could check in with the same friends that I had before I went on a boat and they hadn't done shit, nothing changed. Everything was the same. So, you know, for the four weekends that I would have had to have been out all weekend blowing money and getting loaded, I realized that I didn't miss anything. Every it's like time stood still. And 
I wouldn't have been privy to that perspective had I not started working on the water. Let me backtrack a little bit. I skipped a question. Uh, what were your, did your, uh, your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad, all my life, was with uh, the phone company. It was South Central Bell and then got bought out by AT&T. And um, my mom has done secretary work, worked in offices for as long as I can remember. So was there any family in the maritime industry? No. Uh, I later learned that I think like my grandfather's cousin was a mariner, but um, no, there was no, there was no other influence uh, aside from finding the listing while at the unemployment office. I had, heard the kind of, I had heard the kind of money that they made. And, you know, at that time, uh, working at a loading dock, you know, operating a forklift and picking orders and whatever the hell you were doing, it was, you know, probably wasn't seven, eight bucks, maybe nine bucks an hour. I can't remember. But, I mean, it was it was barely enough to, to pay the bills. I remember one time on the way to work, um, I didn't know what it was when it happened, but uh, the uh, the AC compressor froze on my truck but I didn't know that's what it was. Um, it just started screaming <laughs> because the AC compressor froze. And uh, so the belt started screaming, you know, and my truck stayed parked at that warehouse for damn near a month because I figured out what it was and I knew how much it cost to replace it and bills were that tight. So I couldn't have been making any kind of decent money you know, working at those places. And I had heard people that worked offshore made a bunch of money. So that's what drew me to it, honestly, in the beginning was just financial reasons. Okay. But you said it was just kind of happenstance and curiosity. You saw the listing in an office and went with it. Um, at that time I was, I was, my attitude is whatever it is, just fucking murder it, whatever it is. If, if that's what you want, then murder shit until you get it. If that's what the problem is, kill it. Like, just go at it until one of you dies. And so when it came to, they're like, use this computer. And I mean, shit, at that time, Tim, uh, I, I don't think I even had a computer. I mean, you know, people had computers, but they were a little pricey. I didn't have a computer. So they're like, use that, see what you could find. And, you know, I did. I did what they told me to do and found something, you know. I had done very little i think temp work because i mean that's what happens to people that that go through that uh process you know they get bounced around at temp agencies and things of that nature but um i just kind of shook the bush until something shook and then that's what came out the other end you know yeah how long were you offshore um i worked for that company for five years um they ended up laying off a bunch of people. I was one of them and then they folded, um, which was crazy because they were, I thought a really big company at the time. I mean, they had, they had a bunch of their fleet was flagged foreign. And I, I thought that at that time meant that, um, you know, they were a, a strong company, but maybe they spread themselves too thin in hindsight, you know, but um, yeah, I was with them for five years. Uh, I got to, I got to travel overseas and I got to see just like huge projects. Um, we would go out and, and um, be involved in, in setting up new drilling rigs, um, demoing old dr drilling rigs, um, the, the size. And I had worked at refiners and stuff before, so I'd been up close with industrial operations on a large scale but that was just a whole new animal offshore and i'd come home with pictures to show relatives and i'd point to a spec and i'd be like you see that spec that's a person to give them some sort of perspective you know but the reality was you couldn't you couldn't capture it i saw things out there that i'll, I'll never be able to see again uh, in nature and in industry and um Yep, five years. It sounds like 20 the way I speak about it, but it was only five years. What's the best memory you have from out there? I guess going to Trinidad. Um, 
almost died. I made good friends, uh, partied with all kinds of people. Um, yeah, it was great, dude. I, I really wanted to find my way back there again someday and kept in touch with some of the people that I met while I was out there, but it never did come to fruition. But yeah, I think um, if I had to pick one, it would be it would be Trinidad. Uh, they had they had a lot of problems with uh, the way they had set things up and the the tides and currents there, and um, we had towed out a, a huge uh, it was a huge barge. And it, it had such a deep draft that when it was ballasted out, we could drive through it, underneath it, basically through it. Um, and we had to set them up on anchors. Uh, when you run anchors offshore, once you start, you can't stop until all the anchors are run. And whatever you towed out there and started to help anchor down is stable. And that can take anywhere from 12 hours to 72 or more. Um, so yeah, uh, end result was, uh, went out there, uh, almost died, didn't, uh, didn't get hurt and partied and, you know, that was my first time being out of the country too. So big impact. That's twice you said almost died. Do you want to share that story? <laughs> it was, uh, it was crazy out there. I mean, the, the, the wind and the seas. So Trinidad and I believe it's pronounced uh, to Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Tobago is uh, a small island off the coast and Trinidad is, is on the coast, uh, the northeast coast of uh, South America. And um, if I remember that correctly. And so uh, the, just the, the natural conditions um, out there at that time, which I don't remember what month it, it was during the summer months, but I don't know. I don't remember what month we set sail. I was out there for over two months and, um, we had problems because, uh, they, they prefab sections to, uh, to build, um, drilling rigs and they had already sunk one section. And the second section that they were putting on wasn't high enough for the welders to go work safely. Um, they were on the windward side of this huge platform that we had set up out there and run anchors for. And running anchors is an animal in itself. It's like, uh, what's that What's that show where they, they catch crabs, snow crabs or something like that? And the guys yeah. are bouncing around. It's That'd like, be a catch. Yeah, the deadliest catch. It's it's like watching that back deck on a large scale. Um, and uh, we just, we got caught up in the seas, um, slammed against uh, a barge, made it out of that. And then uh, later on, uh, while we were running anchors, because um, we had to reposition that thing after they realized that the welders were getting hit with the seas and couldn't work. So we had to reposition the whole rig that we towed down there. And uh, while we were doing that, we got caught in a trough, um, and uh, which is basically sideways in the sea, and started to rock so bad that I was sliding back and forth, riding waves across the back deck, and um, managed to keep my feet in front of me so that I didn't hit the uh, metal bulwarks and you know split my head open or something. But so um, it was exciting. I mean, at that time, I didn't have wife, kids or any of that stuff. And I was like, that was fantastic. And, you know, you, you make it out alive and you, you think, uh, you know, you fill your chest with air and you're like, yep, oh, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. Let's do it again, you know? Yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff. But I, yeah. I look back on it finally. I would never do it again, but I look back on it. And where did your career take you after you went uh, got offshore or got back onshore, I guess? Um, after they, so when they laid me off, um, I started looking in the classifieds, the one ads, whatever, the uh, jobs section. And I just remember I was in disbelief. I had already reached out to anybody I knew in the oil field and a lot of places were going through problems at the time. 
uh, even shipyards, because uh, I mean, they're basically the supporting industry um, for, you know, big marine companies. And, and um, everybody was either in a hiring freeze or a layoff phase. Excuse me. And um, I'm looking in the classifieds for jobs and everything says experience necessary. There was even a job, I'll never forget this, man. It was, there was a job for a fry cook at a fast food place. And I, I'll be damned if that thing didn't say experience necessary. And I'm thinking to myself, what does it take, man? You know, <laughs> yeah. when you hear a ding, pull up the basket, come on, man. <laughs> and so I, I realized that the industry chose me at that point. And if I expected to move up from where I was, not necessarily in, in job status or rank or any of those things, but to at least maintain the same amount of income and I guess stature at the workplace, because when you start a new job, you start from the bottom and you start learn, you know, they might tell you to sweep the floor for three months just to see if you'll show up no matter what it is. And you got to eat. Right. right. But I, I realized that basically any experience that i had in the past five years was all marine related and before that it was just whatever i could find which was loading dock or construction or any of that stuff so the the best leg i had to stand on was in the marine industry so i just went after that and what uh, did you how'd your career end up leading to towboats where i met you up there near baton rouge at the time like i said at the time that i got laid off from tidewater um there was a drilling moratorium in the gulf there were no new rigs or exploration or um maintenance on rigs so to speak uh nothing new was was coming out of that and just in that sentence um you're talking about a host of different uh services and companies that provide those services all marine companies um, there wasn't a whole lot of action. And like I told you right before that happened, the company I was working for, they had flagged a lot of vessels foreign. So those vessels were working in foreign ports. Um, if you're on the deck and the vessel goes to a foreign port, it has to hire a crew indigenous to that region. So you're, you can leave the country with a vessel, go do a job and come back, but you're not going to be sailing to and from a port local to a foreign region um unless that vessel is dedicated flagged to that nation at which point they have to hire an indigenous crew so um offshore was kind of out at that point for me as an option um so i i was applying to anything boat related and um an inland tow company called me and Although it was an incredible cut in pay, I don't remember what it was exactly. It was like a hundred to one hundred and twenty dollars a day less to go work inland for me as a deck crew at that time. But I had been searching for a while. I I had just about burned through any four hundred one k I had saved up from the previous company, um, and it wasn't for lack of trying. I was never, especially at that point, I wasn't lazy. Um, and there was a sense of urgency always with me because I lived on my own since I was 18. So, I mean, I knew what it was to not pay a bill. I knew what it was. I knew what's going to happen if, you know, the lights ain't going to be on tomorrow, <laughs> you know? So I just, I took it because it was all I could find at the time. And, um, like I said, starting in a, it's basically a new industry, even though it's still Marine related and you're working on a, a deck, it's just a hundred percent different from working offshore. Working inland is a hundred percent different from working offshore. So um, it was like starting over again, big pay cut, um, learning uh, just a, a different anatomy, a different ship has a different anatomy and um, you know, different vessels and different crews working in different areas. They're all gonna have practices that are unlike you've seen before. So. It was like starting over again, you know. Any interesting uh, stories or tidbits of memory from 
decking all the way up to the wheelhouse? Not really interesting. I, I never did mind. I never did mind um, always working on a project. Um, the end result, the bottom line for me is offshore and inland, you get to work with equipment that you're probably never going to be able to afford in your lifetime. The, the, just, just the, the magnitude or the size of, of the machinery that they use to accomplish their goals is, is far more expensive and larger than you will ever be able to attain or really necessarily ever need. So I always felt like learning, not only just being able to tinker around with stuff like that, but learning from other people that knew a few things about it was an incredible opportunity. I, I don't know to what end necessarily, but I just felt like that's a privilege, you know what I mean? And you're picking up free knowledge from some old pros, you know? Some guys come around, even even if it's just a mechanic that steps on the boat, you know, 65 year old grumpy as shit and he just wants to know where the coffee is and scratch his ass, but go spend, you know, two hours with him down in the engine room and you're gonna walk out knowing 20 more things than the captain does if you just pay attention. And then there's some people that just go out there and float around and hope to get a check, you know. But I, I just feel like there's a lot of opportunity out there once you've done it for a while, because you're learning the whole boat, every system, the air system, the oil system, the, the cooling system, the water. You're learning um, it's got regular features like a house would, like AC units and ductworth and walk, washers and dryers and appliances. Like you're just learning how to deal with septic systems. Like you're just learning how things work and how to service them and what typical uh, breakages they experience. And just, it's just a wealth of knowledge, really, if you pay attention, you know. Um, no specific stories, like no crazy exciting stuff, really. Um, that was kind of saved for the offshore experiences, I guess. Things kind of got wild out there, but uh, but I, I don't I don't feel like uh, as far as the deck goes, nothing crazy, but just a, a lot of hard work and lots to learn. And um, I don't know, I wouldn't I wouldn't give it up for the world. You know what I mean? I don't think that um, me as a captain, anybody deserves to be a captain unless they've sweated it out on the deck for years. You know, but um. I guess I've stuck with it all this time because uh, I was never, I never shied away from hard work, and I, I like, I like uh, the grit. You know what I mean? You get it done by any means necessary, or shut the fuck up. You know? Roger. You don't have to. You know? You don't have to tell me where you've been or what you did because it's gonna show in the calluses in your hands or what you do next or like all those things. There's no, you can't, bull, there's a lot of bullshitters out there. I won't say that, but you can't bullshit me. And it's not because I got a crystal ball. It's because I've been out there, you know? Right. How long have you been out there? Uh, right, man. You, you asked me that earlier. So I had to tally it up. Inland, inland, I think will be, uh, I think March makes 13 years. And then offshore, I worked for Tidewater for about five years. So it'll be 18 years in, in the next couple months. How long were you on deck before you started moving up? And did you make a stop with the engineers? No. Um, I had two choices, man. I sized that up when I was working offshore. And I was like, man... I'd go down in the engine room because even on a deck level working offshore, you have a choice. You can, you can uh, decide to be an oiler, which is basically an engineer's helper, or you can decide to work the deck. Um, it's two different departments, the deck and the wheelhouse uh, co-mingle and the engineering is kind of onto itself. And I'd go down in the engine room occasionally and it was just hot and shitty down there, man. It was hot and shitty. And I looked around and I'm like, y'all are under the water right now. <laughs> y'all are going to be the first to go and the last to know. 
and um, I saw the way that the, the captains lived. And they, they're kind of equivalent if you want to establish a pecking order, the engineer and the captain when it comes to offshore. Um, but I mean, if you look at the conditions that you work in, in the wheelhouse as opposed to the engine room, you've got to really love engines to want to dive down there, you know what I mean? I, I decided early on that I was I was going to shoot for the wheelhouse, you know. Um, and for the longest time, I felt like it wasn't real life. That's what I used to say. I would say this ain't real life. This is just work. Real life starts when you get back to your house, you know. But I realized over time that you spend so much of your time out there. And if you keep calling it that, then you're ne kind of negating the majority of your life. The existence of the majority of your life, you're just not putting anything into it, or you're just doing enough to get by, you know, and it, it kind of made me feel like if you're going to spend all this time out here, uh, number one, yeah, it's real life and you better start looking at it like that. And number two, if you don't shoot for the top, then you're just bullshitting yourself, you know, so um, I don't remember what your question was. I kind of went off on a tangent there. That was how long... Uh... Primarily, how long were you on deck before you moved on up? Oh, right. Offshore, I spent that entire time on deck. I had started talking to people in the office. Um, this same guy, I kept talking to him in the office about uh, starting my steersman course. Uh, I had acquired some of the books to study and workbooks and things of that nature. But I, I worked on deck the whole time that I was offshore. So that's five years. And then when I started inland, as I said, it was kind of like starting over. So I ended up decking inland for an additional between five and six years. So all told, roughly 10 years I spent on deck offshore and inland. Was there a steersman program when you moved up? Uh, when I finally moved up, there was a steersman program. Um, when I was working inland and uh, it was, was kind of ass backwards. It, it seemed like a uh, good old boy mentality because I would keep in touch with some of the people that came up alongside of me as far as when we got hired on and what our job status was positions. And, you know, they'd get off the phone with the office and then call me or vice versa and would be getting told the same thing, you know, like, Oh, you, you're number two or you're number three in line. You're like, Damn, he told me I was number three. Of them. And, you know, the the leadership of the steersman program changed hands um, quite a few times just during the the uh, the window where I was, I guess you could say, eligible. And um, so it became hard to establish any kind of working relationship, so to speak, with anybody that was heading up the program. Because before long, give it two or three years, they'd put somebody new in that person's place and he would call you and he'd say, you know, who are you? I had somebody call me after I'd, you know, supposedly been in the program and all this other stuff. Head of that program calls me and says, who are you? Okay, well, uh, I wrote your name down. I'll, I'll get back to you. It's like starting over again. <laughs> right. So were you in the steersman program or you did it sort of more traditionally? Um, as far as, as far as my company at that time said, I was in the steersman program. Um, and I, I guess they kind of groom you for that mentality, so to speak, because when you get out of all of the schooling and get all of the certificates and things, you're told that you're on standby for this program. And then, you know, two years goes by. And then they tell you, all right, you're officially in the program. You're still doing the same thing, decking and maybe steering when you can, if the captain says it's all right, but you're in this program. It's like this fictitious gentleman's order. <laughs> and um, you end up getting it, to, I guess, to answer your question, I ended up getting it traditionally, I guess if you call it that, um, forging out some sort of relationship, a.k.a. working your ass off for a captain and getting him to decide you're all right and I'll, I'll steer you, you know, 
All right, well, switching topics to uh, the focus of this conversation. At some point along the way, uh, you started a project that has now become NewOrleansMusicians.com. Yeah. Tell me where that started. Man, it was, uh, it was a long time ago. Um, a friend of mine told me that he found someone that was selling a website, but that he lost touch with him and he really he was just kind of venting to me, I guess, or I don't even know if he was posing the question, but long story short, he, he lost touch with the guy that was selling it. He described him to me. I realized that I was good friends with the guy. I just didn't know that about him and, um, reconnected them, um, on the agreement that I would be included. Um, so apparently the site was originally new Orleans bands.net. Um, and it was built by the person who founded it, Daniel Carone, and he made it, it was, it was kind of like a, a chat forum and it networked bands and it was, it was, uh, I guess, simple in nature or direct to the point, but simple in nature, but, um, it became fairly large. I mean, he, he saw to it that over 300 bands were on boarded. And at one time it was used as a messaging forum for people that were in bands, but displaced by hurricane Katrina, because, uh, anything that was down here was gone and, uh, his hosting happened to be out of town. So it stayed online, but, uh, that's how it got started. Um, and through a series of negotiations, I ended up owning the website outright and, um, I took it from there, redesigned it and took it from there. And how many years now have you run it yourself? Oh man. Well, so, okay, let's back it up one second. I, after bringing those two guys together and talking to the guy that founded it and started it, Daniel. Um, I thought that everything was in order, but with me working offshore, um, and I guess him a little bit of trepidation on his point on his part, um, lost touch. We couldn't get in touch with him again. And we thought he got cold feet. But I love the idea so much that I started drawing the whole website because I'd go out for a month at a time. So I drew the whole website, every screen you would see in a notebook. And if the screen had five links, I would label them A1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you'd go look it up in the back and I would have a page for that. Like I just redesigned in my mind what I thought it could be. Um, I eventually got back in touch with him. The purchase was made, et cetera, et cetera. But when I took this design to a website, I believe that at first, well, it doesn't matter. I took it to a web firm to get the website made and um, was basically defrauded out of like at least $5,000. Mm. Um, it got to be ridiculous. They would, I would go to meet with them and they would show me mock-ups and you can make a mock-up work just like you can make an Excel spreadsheet work. But that doesn't mean it's an online entity and it doesn't mean that it's, it's going to receive and or disseminate information, you know, online. So um, it, it got bad. Uh, <laughs> one of the excuses I was given was uh, um, the programmer barricaded himself in his house with the contents of my website on disk. I wonder if I still have that email. <laughs> it just, it got bad. And I don't know if it was because I was um, young and they figured they could get over on me or if it was because, which I didn't know at the time, they didn't have any in-house programs. They subbed out all their work. So they were just a go between. And it was a guy that liked to go schmooze and rub elbows with upper echelon. You know, they, they had big clients like shell, you know, but, um, I think he was more of a, a mixer than, uh, than a programmer or, or any technical aspect. So, that went to shit, um, put it down for a while because I'm financing this all myself. Um, you know, I'm living in a one bedroom apartment, working on the deck. I'm, I'm you know, I got a, a few bucks, but not a whole lot. 
and um, put it down for a little while, two, three years, and then uh, try it again with another firm from out of town uh, in Kentucky, I believe it was, and I flew out there to meet them and uh, just went to shit again. They just kind of put me on the back burner. And I, I don't know, again, if it was my age or um, just novice uh, in the field or uh, if I expected too much or I, I don't know. Uh, I, I felt like I held up my end because I came up front with the expectations and I knew what it would cost. So I made sure I had the money ready, you know. But uh, again, it got put on the back burner. And after that, I shelved it for years. I was pissed. I was like, this is never going to happen. I'm, I'm out like, I don't even know, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000, whatever the tally was, you know. So it's been a long time coming is what I'm trying to get at. And um, I could tell you when it all started roughly, but it's on and off throughout the years up until this point, basically, you know. And what triggered your uh, your commitment to it more recently? And how when, when was that when you dove back in? Uh, the beginning of the beginning of twenty one, two thousand twenty one. Um, I had up until that point maintained ownership of several domains. Um, at that point, I had changed the name to um, neworleansmusicians.net only because I couldn't score .com, but I changed it to New Orleans Musicians because it was rede redesigned in my mind um, and partially on, on online. And uh, it just kind of, I wanted it to be something different, um, more, more encompassing, I suppose. But anyway, I had maintained uh, the domains and kept adding to it. And I think to date, I have 23 domains that lead, all lead to it. And they're, they're all um, germane uh, names, like uh, you got the neworleansbands.net, the original neworleansbands.com, neworleansmusicians.net.com. If I could get a .org, I would you know, throw all of this stuff in together. So I kept all of those things. And my wife is like, you got to shit or get off the pot. Like you're keeping this alive in your mind only, you know? And I guess it was out of discouragement or whatever had happened in the past, but I also knew the amount of money and time and headache and intric intricacies that are involved in dealing with something of this magnitude. So, um, I'd kind of left it on the back burner because starting a family and buying a house and a new vehicle and, you know, getting some property and, you know, all those things take up your money as well. So it, it's just been a long time coming. After she started mentioning that, I believe uh, middle of 21, I uh, started looking for a programmer. Late in 21, hired a programmer. Then all through uh, the rest of, uh, let's say the last quarter of 21 and all of 22, um, worked with a programmer to get it to what it is now. And what it is now, I think, I definitely shouldn't be in charge of any more features <laughs> because I have more than my hands full. Um, but I really feel like it, it serves a, a big purpose. Um, marketing and, and things of that nature, those are super expensive black holes, man. Uh, you, could, you could throw $50 in and then cross your fingers and hope you get $50 worth of whatever, um, traffic, whatever it is you were shooting for. But it's never guaranteed. Seldom happens, you work on percentages and um, it's it's very expensive. So I just, I try a lot of grassroots marketing, you know, so I, I realize it's gonna be slow going, but um, I, I think uh, by the hardest, I've built something that encompasses a lot of Louisiana's music scene, because I've, I've opened it to anybody, any resident of the state. I think New Orleans is the hub 
uh, for Louisiana music. Um, but uh, I want to welcome everyone in the state. How, uh, how big is the website now and do you generate money from it? Um, like big in terms of what metric? I, how many users, how many registered users, how many bands, how many, uh, yeah. what is it just a, a community forum still for bands or what else is it? Okay. So you, everybody gets a, a profile and I try to treat bands like businesses. I want them to set up their profile and lay out a professional bio. Um, any music or videos they upload will be on that bio, their contact information, uh, if they're under uh, management, label, uh, all those stats that are relative to music business. And I want it to be for the promotion of music business. I don't want it to be social like a Facebook or anything like that. So there's no accommodations for that. It's not really a forum per se. Um, so all bands that are from Louisiana get that. Um, there's also a directory for vendors, which are supporting services for bands, which is uh, a and R's, bus charters, sound and light companies, venues, um, anybody that provides lodging, hotels, B and B's. Um, there's a directory for um, bands to use to be able to kind of do for themselves. I want bands to see it as a utility for business. And um, in the meantime, there's a few other things that other people like fans might find interesting. There's a page with streaming music by genre. So if you want to hear just local rock or just local jazz or just local reggae, then you can go there and, and you know, stream that. Um, same with the videos. You can go check out videos and it'll be everything from uh, me interviewing musicians or recording studio owners um, to music videos to uh, coming soon. I got a guy's putting up uh, uh, instructional videos on his uh, instrument applications, you know, things of that nature. Anything that I can be involved with that shows uh, more of the same and a different side of music in Louisiana the personal side, et cetera. How many profiles are you hosting right now? I think last I counted, there were 67. It's mostly bands. It's a few recording studios. Um, there's a guy that's an opera house owner. There's a travel agent. There's, there's a bunch of different characters on there. And uh, the traffic, I monitor all the stats to see how it's doing. And it's kind of run the gamut. Um, some months it's up over 800 users. Um, other months I've seen it as low as 500. It'll vary. And um, we launched at the beginning of 2022, kind of simultaneously working out any bugs that we could find while we watched it actually get used. And uh, I've spent most of 22 uh, refining it and adding to it. What's uh, any plans to grow it further? Or what's the big dream? What's the the realization of the of the project for you? Right. Well, I'm just trying to keep it in steps, I suppose, one step at a time. Right now, I, I just want to I want to onboard as many bands as possible. Um, I'd like to see between three and four hundred bands on there, um, and I. I, I kind of chose that number arbitrarily, but I was sitting down with a, a, a marketer earlier this year. And after reviewing my site, he said, I can't, I can't take your money because I can't take your site and market it to, I wanted him to fill the vendor directory. I was like, look, I want, I'm going to take care of the bands. I want you to take care of onboarding venues and, you know, A&Rs, things of that nature, market to these guys. And he's like, I can't take your money because you don't have the bands on there yet. I'm like, well, you know, we just, we just opened for business, so to speak. I'm working on that. And he's like, well, you know, if you wanted to look through a directory of the musicians to find, to book people for a show, how big of a directory do you think would be a decent sized directory that you would find 
a valuable resource. And I was like, I don't know, three or 400 bands. And he's like, well, look, get three or 400 bands and then you'll be giving me, even by your own standard, something to market to these vendors. I was like, man, he's right. And he didn't take my money and I'll go see him. I was like, that's all I'm going to try to do this year. You know, I've, I've battled um, some technical difficulties, growing pains, if you will, um, with a side of the size and uh, just kind of muscling through that and, and still trying to or onboard people one at a time if it takes it, you know. Uh, sometimes it, it, it'll come in waves and in other times it's crickets for a while. You never know. Uh, but uh, the ultimate goal, I suppose, is quite simply, I want it to be the source for music in Louisiana. Um, if enough bands join, then all the other eyes will be on the site. You, your supporting services will come because it'll be a resource for them, you know, to market their to to market their own wares, if you will. You know, I sell this service, I sell that service. That's fine. You know, this this is our this is our demographic, Louisiana musicians. You know, and then things like Hollywood South become relevant. Um, and maybe through that, if I can bring everybody to the table, then I can help a ton of people. It's it's like uh, I'm building my own black book, but everybody's privy to it. You know what I mean? And if I can help a band, uh, book a tour, or um, if I can line up uh, a director with a band for some music, which I've, I've helped people do these things, but this is what I want the site to do and I want people to recognize it as a reliable brand, uh, a trustworthy brand, and and uh, a resource, you know. And it comes in numbers. If people all get together, then it becomes the one spot. It'll always be free, you know. Well, I'm new to this podcast game, but numbers are the name of the game here, too. Um, all right. So we have your wife to thank, to some degree, for kickstarting yeah. this project. Kickstarting the project, uh, making sure I stay alive, all those things. Yep. Tell me where y'all met. Um, funny enough, I met her while I was working offshore on a dating website, which I was convinced was a stupid concept. <laughs> to me, I felt like when they first introduced dating websites, I felt like those are for people that can't go to a bar and hook up with a chick, you know, but it became interesting to me because I realized I'm gone for a month. We can get a whole lot of talking done in a month, you know, and um, I would I would use it as a way to make up for lost time, I guess, without having to be out every weekend and who knows where doing God knows what running into whoever you ran into, you know, and, um, but yeah, so I met her on a dating website and, um, that was that man. She, she didn't talk to me. She didn't even say anything on my profile. She passed me by and I saw she was there and I was like, Ooh, let me see who that is. <laughs> it took me like four months of talking to her to get a date. But, um, I, I guess looking back, that was a quality, you know? And how long until y'all got married? two years, man. Um, we were seeing each other. Let's see how long it was about, it was a little over two years. Um, she had, she already had a child at the time. And, um, <clears throat> I was just like playing the field, being a single guy, you know what I mean? I had like hardly any responsibilities. Um, so, I mean, I, I could see the writing on the wall, so to speak. The crowd was getting younger, that type of thing, you know. And I knew I wouldn't always be running the streets forever. And I'd heard about this thing called growing up, and I was like, well, maybe I'll give that a shot. And I, I definitely had to to, to um, attract her attention, you know. So um, here I am all growing up, Tim. <laughs> I'm watching it live. How about, yeah. uh, how about kids? I think I saw on Facebook last night you have a – Almost seven year old now. Yes, he turned seven um, this past Wednesday. What is it? Thursday. So yesterday, 
he turned seven. And um, like I said, she had one when I met her. And um, gosh, he's, she'll kill me because I don't know his age now. He's like 20 now. Um, he had a child and he is in between jobs constantly, it seems. So um, now we have his infant. So I have a seven-year-old and a really tiny infant in the house and um, takes up 120% of my time. Grandpa grown up, huh? Yeah. That, I think, is the most offensive part of all of this. Somebody says I'm a grandfather now, and I'm like, I don't feel grandfatherish. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> well, uh, what else do you have going on in your life, man? Honestly, that's it. I, I try and carve out a little time for myself. Um, I've been building a, a 76 Chevy for, it seems like, forever now. Ida came through and crushed half of it. I had to start over with that. And um, I'm close. And I, I've, I've decided in my mind that I'll delegate some of the duties elsewhere because I just don't have the time. But I just want to make sure I build the power plant and I'll be, I'll be good with that. So I, I really, um, whenever I can, I, I try to find time to do that. And uh, I love writing music, man, and creating stuff. All this this website stuff for me means uh, it's a lot, Tim. It's uh, two podcasts a month, uh, at least four videos a month, um, two articles a month, and that's just what gets published. Um, with every person I interview, I usually interview two to three people a month, so I have to fit that in the 10 days that I'm home. But each person generates an article, a podcast, and five to 10, roughly, YouTube videos, all edited and with graphics and new thumbnails, all these things. So um, I've kind of adhered to that schedule as much as I could. It's a lot. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, what instruments do you play? I play a keyboard and I play a little bass guitar and uh, I work on um, digital audio workstation. So uh, a little, little bit of everything, I guess, you know. All right. Well, it sounds like you don't need to be kept busy, my friend. <laughs> no. So look, man, I appreciate your time. Go get back to it. Get some rest. Do whatever it is you're doing, brother. Absolutely. Thanks, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot.